But just to finish a bit about the first lecture, <clears throat> I will go fast on that. <laughs> but just the main difference between classical and quantum computing. Let's try to do fast. <laughs> Not that all quantum operations are unitary to preserve the norm for the physical sake. And they are then reversible. So any gate that you apply should be reversible. Any algorithm that you apply should be reversible. This is not the case of classical computing because classical computing can copy a lot of things. And so they are normally not reversible. But the TOEFL gate is a universal reversible gate for classical computing. What does it mean? It means actually that any classical algorithm can be with some additional uh, complexity, be translated into an equivalent algorithm that is reversible. So any classical algorithm can be reversible. I believe it's written different, thanks to the TOEFL. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means that any classical algorithm can have a quantum analog. So we can, uh, with a quantum algorithm, uh, emulates uh, any classical algorithm. It doesn't mean that it's better. It just means that we can do it. That's it. And is the reverse also true? The reverse is not true because of entanglement. The entangled states have no classical analogs. Mm -hmm. So there are stuff that class quantum computer can do and classical computers cannot. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, does it mean that you can uh, use only total case for any, you can imagine any, any classical algorithm? Algorithm with only the total case? Yes. I'm not expert on that, that's what I read, but it's a universal reversible bit. So, uh, yes, normally there is the, uh, did I remove it somewhere? I'm not mm -hmm. talking about the universal operation. Mm -hmm. Any classical algorithm can be written either with mm -hmm. an end. Or, and our gates, those two are also universal for classical computers, and the TOEFL gate. And the advantage of TOEFL is that it's reversible, but it uh, adds complexity. So if you want to change your classical uh, algorithm to be reversible, you have to add complexity to it, but it's equivalently the same. For quantum computer, we also have this uh, a universal set of gates that we can apply, meaning that if we have a given set of gates that are universal, we can emulate any quantum algorithm with those gates. What are they? Uh, there are different sets of gates. I mean, it depends on uh, the hardware. The hardware can sometimes implement some gates and some other are not. So they had to find some equivalence between the universal set of gates that you can use. Uh, one of the uh, known uh, thing is the Toffoli. You can use the Toffoli gate plus some non-trivial single qubit gates like the phase gate. You can also use only two qubit gates like the synapse and uh, the set of uh, a single qubit gates. So for instance, if you have all the rotation gates, normally you have all the single qubit operation because you can do any points on the block sphere. So if you have those three gates and the synapse, you also have a universal quantum computer. You can do any operation with that. There are another set of gates that is called the Clifford uh, set. It's a C naught plus S gate. So S gate is a kind of phase gate with a particular phase, same as T gate is also a, a phase gate with a, a particular. And the Hadamard one. Mm -hmm. So the Clifford set, uh, if you have algorithms that are only um, that do only contain uh, quantum logical gates made from the Clifford set, it's actually classical, uh, classically uh, efficiently simulated. So a quantum algorithm made of only those gates is not very interesting. Not very interesting. It's just that we know it's classically simulated, efficient. The way the word efficient is. So normally when people talk about quantum computers, there are a lot of papers uh, mentioning quantum advantage for some particular physical system or stuff like that. The, they call what he, they uh, calculate the T count. So the number of T gates that they have to apply on the quantum algorithm. And this is kind of the measure of the complexity of the quantum algorithm compared to the classical one. I'm not expert on that, but... Uh, 
<coughs> this is something uh, to take a so yeah, no key fork gates. So the gates that are not from the key fork set are very important to uh, do important computing uh, algorithm that is efficient, more efficient than a classical algorithm. Uh, making copy, so I just mentioned it uh, rapidly, but we can do the simple mathematics as well. Can we copy a step? In classical computing, we can. We know, I mean, we just add a wire, uh, uh, this is that. And it's very powerful. But for a quantum state, it's not possible. Imagine you have a state psi and s. You want to uh, that s become psi. And you keep psi because it has to be a copy, not just a teleportation. Teleportation, we know we have. But a copy is different. So we don't know psi. OK. So let's assume we don't know psi. And uh, we also want, of course, the, the machine in the, the gate to be able to copy any psi state, not, uh, not just one particular person. Imagine we have psi or uh, phi. Yeah. So we have two different states that are arbitrary, uh, and we want s to become uh, psi or phi. So what does it mean? It means that if you apply the unitary to this tensor product, we should end up with the tensor product of the two states. Okay. Uh, and same for five. Okay. Now, if we do the inner product of those states, knowing that the transformation is unitary, well, we actually end up with the fact that the uh, inner product of those two states uh, is equal to the square inner product of those two states. What does it mean? It means that the only solution is that uh, psi and, uh, and phi are equal or <laughs> orthogonal. So it has to be one or zero. Um, and so definitely this transformation, any you can you cannot define the unitary transformation that can copy <laughs> an arbitrary state psi or phi, because they, here you see that the constraint they have to be orthogonal. So it's not any arbitrary state. Right? So there is no quantum cloning device, it's impossible. So that's also we have to uh, Okay, so uh, the take home messages from this first lecture was how quantum computing differs from classical computing, the superposition, the entanglement, the fact that we collapse, so that can appear uh, quite uh, uh, bad news at the beginning, but sometimes it's also, it allows some efficient measurements. The no cloning the theorem, so we cannot copy, and we are reversible. So that's really the main difference with classical computing. And the main work of quantum computing is to develop efficient quantum algorithm for practical, real, and industrial uh, 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 applications. And so it's really a new vision of computing. Yeah, I ask a stupid question. Yeah, but so the fact that the transformation is unitary, uh, that's a strong argument for showing you cannot copy. So yeah. why not considering a, a non unitary transformation? It's uh, dead end, it doesn't help, or? Um, it just, here we, I'm working with the uh, with, uh, isolated physical systems. Um, if you work with uh, something that is non-unitary, you have another field of open systems. And that's not what I want to do for me. I mean, certainly it can be. Uh, the fact that there is noise you know, on quantum gates is uh, actually a kind of application of a non-unitary uh, operation. But does it mean that we like can the, think of copying something? Or anyway, it's it's not. Because now, now I see that the proof that unitary yeah. is a very strong argument. Yes. Now I see, I understand what you meant. But then, so if, if it's not unitary, then it is this possibility to copy or still it's... Uh, I don't know. Uh, intuitively, I would say no. But, uh, I should try to do another proof to so. mm. uh, Just references, maybe if you are interested. Uh, so I got inspired really by uh, some lectures by Kenneth Mossal in Montpellier. And uh, Le Roy also uh, did an introduction to quantum informatics. And I, uh, inspired, I got inspired also in, mainly by this book. If you really want to learn about quantum information, this book is the Bible in quantum computing. 
and government financial. So I, uh, if really you are interested about it, this is a very nice tool. And Wikipedia helped. All right, so let's move to the second lecture. Um, Sorry, can, I, can I have a question sure. yes, at the very beginning? You said it, but I lost the point. <laughs> can you explain again the uh, relation between unitary operators and Pauli matrices? Because I love it. The Pauli matrices are the unitary. Okay. They are unitary. But uh, these operators, like the Hadamard or the other, are uh, um, combinations of Pauli matrices? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> any, I think, yes, because any rotation. It can be written as a cosine plus i sine of Pauli matrices, so the of Pauli matrices. So yes, any single qubit operation can be written in the basis of the Pauli matrices. Okay. Yes. So I don't know by heart what are the... And any unitary operation can be written as a combination of this four or five uh, operators you have, you have shown, or, or this is something for well, single uh, yes, uh, for single key. Yes, yes, yes. So X, Y, Z, identity and Hadamard, any combination of them is a uh, unit of operation. Yeah, no, no. So, the combinations are, I know, the, yes, so, the no, okay. yeah, 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 yes, yeah, the, they are generators. Ah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you add them, no. Uh, for instance, the Hamiltonian okay. is a Hermitian operator, not unitary, and it can be decomposed in a uh, sum of uh, product of powers. Okay. Yeah, as you see on the sum, then it's not unitary. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. So I let's move to the second lecture. So normally it will be much less about. Uh, the definition of uh, quantum mechanics and stuff like that. It's more ap uh, applications and what kind of algorithms we are using for quantum chemistry or even any mechanical. So first, the intuition is that quantum computing now and quantum technology in general are divided into four parts. Quantum communication, so that's typically the quantum uh, teleportation exercise that we've seen. So they want to do a uh, quantum internet, a secure transmission, and stuff like that. There are the development of quantum sensors, so to have a better sensitivity, resolution. Uh, and the two fields that are closely related to what we do is quantum simulation and quantum computing. So this is how they were defined, uh, roughly. So quantum simulation to, to emulate uh, chemical reaction uh, and simulate material properties and quantum computing for power flow calculation. So in quantum chemistry or physics, the two are kind of related. The difference is subtle sometimes. But for most quantum simulation, the device is really trying to simulate the, the physical system, meaning that you will apply process and stuff like that such that your uh, physical system really model, uh, uh, your device sorry, really model the physical system you want to, uh, to simulate. Yeah. Um, I believe you won't be talking about that. That's quantum mm -hmm. sensors. Can you say in a few words why you can expect a better sensitivity and resolution? I must confess, I don't find this intuitive. Uh, I'm not, not sure whether it's feasible to say it in a few words. So it's not uh, it's not quantum computing that would help to do quantum sensors. It's really the four pillars of quantum technology. Yeah, meaning that they all, those four pillars are also just experimental stuff. And yeah. so it's not uh, really quantum computing here. They just it just means that. Uh, uh, quantum flagship, I mean, all the money that is involved in quantum stuff is also one part is also just the development of new experimental uh, design. Well, I understand it's not directly related. I'm just trying to put something behind quantum sensors. In what, why should I get with this? Uh, why should I get better sensitivity and resolution when sensing? I don't know, just trying to. 
Absolutely. But when you say with this, what do you mean? Um, you mean quantum? quantum I, I've got the impression I can use some kind of pre prepared quantum state, measure some property. Okay. <laughs> and then I can have a better resolution than I get with usual ones. That's what I understand. But maybe I'm confused. And, you know, okay, it's not the point. And we can discuss that later the, uh, at the lunch break, maybe just mm -hmm. to get a clearer idea. I'm definitely not expert on that. Okay. I okay. So. Oh, no worries. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. So, yeah, the main difference between quantum simulation and quantum computing is that quantum computing should not care about the system. Mm -hmm. You have to apply quantum logical gates to a given problem, sure, but uh, the gates should be uh, really good. You should not have noise. Uh, the point is really uh, is really just to, to give an algorithm to the machine. She will end up with a result. Uh, and it should not be really dependent on the problem that you input. <laughs> we are not trying really to, to simulate the system. Okay. Uh, computing, li like a classical computer, the properties of the system, the energy of the system, stuff like that, but without trying to model it. I don't know if you see that. So if you want to optimize parameters of a neural network, for example, that would be in the quantum computing. Uh, the, uh, of neural I mean, if you want to use the, I don't know, yeah, like you have a, a problem that is usually solved on a classical computer, like, uh, yeah, optimization of mm -hmm. neural network parameters or machine learning kind of stuff. Yeah, now, if you try to do it on a quantum computer, that's what we call quantum computer. Yeah. There is no physical system, and it's just. A, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. I'll go with this. The quantum simulation is more like uh, trying to. Uh, to apply directly the, the propagator, the time evolution of the radar in the machine with pulses and stuff like that mm -hmm. to, to simulate the system. Quantum computing, we will see, we do not do that. We can do it. Maybe I can have that. Uh, yeah. Just to talk the discussion, quantum simulation, it's, uh, it's actually um, where you dedicate a specific platform for a very specific task, and it will be really efficient for this task. Let's say simulating the time evolution of a specific system, and that's it. Quantum computing, it's more general, and we can implement various type of algorithms. So quantum computers, they are more powerful in this way. But maybe less uh, efficient mm -hmm. compared to a given quantum simulator that is dedicated to specific uh -huh. So maybe you have to mm -hmm. so, okay. so just for uh, the recording, so Seth said that uh, the quantum simulation is more dedicated to a specific type of system. It will be certainly more efficient for this type of system, but quantum computing is more universal. And uh, so it does not really depend on the system you work on. But it can be slower and more difficult to implement. All right. All right. And so I will be focused on quantum computing only. I don't actually work on the other thing. And there are uh, different applications of quantum computing. So, as uh, Emmanuel said, like neural networks, for instance. Uh, also, finance, optimization problems. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, I remember the word in English, but I may be wrong. Broadcasting. Broadcasting. Right. Uh, cryptography, like the Peter Shaw's uh, algorithm. And we are focused on physical problems, so uh, chemical or physical problems. So, first, before starting about quantum computing, I would like to, because I think the audience is uh, physics, mathematics, and chemistry, so we would like to, to set the, the problem I, I am interested in. So I am interested in the electronic structure problem. So imagine a molecule which has n nuclei and n electrons, and there are Miltonian real light bits. So where you have the kinetic part of the electron, the kinetic part of the nuclei, the attraction between uh, nuclei and electrons, the repulsion between the electrons, and the repulsion between the uh, nuclei. But because the nuclei are much bigger, uh, much heavier than electrons, we can usually apply the Born Oppenheimer approximation, meaning that we can decouple the nuclei from the electrons, the movement of the nuclei compared to the dynamics of the electron. And we can also use some atomic units. And at the end, the Hamiltonian is much simpler. It reads this, so it's an electronic Hamiltonian. 
we have still the kinetic part of the electrons. The attraction between electron and nuclei is not considered frozen. And uh, the repulsion between the electrons. And usually we want to, I will to time dependent, but I wanted to time independent. So I am interested about the time independence, no relativistic Schrodinger equation. So I want to solve this problem on a classical or on a quantum computer. So uh, usually we work with a second quantization. So we work in a finite basis of orbitals. Uh, or phenomenal orbitals, yeah. So those are spin orbitals that are not uh, phi uh, B. And X is uh, just the spatial and spin coordinates of the electron. And if we project the Hamiltonian on this basis, we obtain such kind of formula, uh, where the H, P, Q are the one electron integrals. So those are the integrals in the basis of the uh, spin orbitals. And you see that there is the kinetic parts and the attraction between uh, the electron and the nuclei. So this is the one electronic part that is computed classically. Uh, the A dagger and A are the creation and annihilation operator. So you create or annihilate an electron from an orbital to another. And then the second part is the two body part. So you have the two uh, electronic integral here, but uh, the electron. And you have four uh, annihilation and creation operators. So uh, from orbital P and Q, uh, and you annihilate uh, the uh, electrons in orbital S and R. And so just uh, to fulfill the, the fermionic uh, anti-commutation relation, uh, we have this uh, anti-commutation rule split because it's a fermionic system. So that's the problem I'm looking for. And uh, I set some colors here because the blue part will always be computed on a classical computer. We will never play with that with a quantum computer, for now, at least. We are not interested about it. But we will play with the creation and annihilation operators on the quantum computer, as we will see later. But first, let's define the full many-body problem in a given basis. So usually, we work with the slatter determinants. So the slatter determinants of a many-body problem, so we have n e uh, electrons here. It is defined so this way, but it is a uh, determinant. So it's an anti symmetrized product of a single electron balance function that we have. And we can write it this way. So here it's a bit important because you see that it's called the occupation number representation. So it contains n orbitals, okay, and you numerate it from 1 to n. And each of those orbitals have the value 0 or 1. 0 if it's empty, 1 if it's occupied. So if you look at this, it's kind of binary string, right? We have a chain of 0 and 1. So that's already a kind of a, a <laughs> mapping between the classical computers and uh, the slatter determinant. So one slatter determinant can be encoded into a bit string. And uh, this bit string has an integer value. So we can also equivalently write this bit string by an integer value like this, f being an integer value, an integer value. OK, so that's just notation. Uh, so the second context for malism, uh, so the operation, the annihilation and creation operator, that you work in this basis of a binary string, so slatter determinants, those occupation vectors. And you can write any state of your Hilbert, Hilbert space into this uh, as a linear combination of these many body bases, so the, all the possible uh, slatter determinants that forms your know, many body bases. <coughs> and if your physical problem conserves the number of electrons, if you still have n uh, e electrons, then your basis is of size uh, n e uh, in n. So uh, you have this size for your many body bases. All right. So let's see how we can do that on a quantum computer. What is the link with quantum computer? If you may remember, um, the qubit was a superposition of 0 and 1. 
And I just said that if you look at the occupation of representation, zero means an empty orbital and one means an occupied orbital. Uh, so mapping the state of a qubit into the occupation of an orbital, doing this one-to-one -one mapping between the two is called the jordan Wigner encoder. <laughs> So if we look at the state of a qubit register with a lot of qubits, so n qubits, we know that we can generate a quantum state with a superposition of 2 to the power of n bit strings, right? You remember? So uh, we can actually write the state of the n qubit register as a summation of an exponential in many number of what I will call now configuration, which are nothing but bit strings, okay? So, and all those bit strings form the computational basis of our quantum computer, of uh, the Hilbert space, right? the state space of uh, the quantum computer that we have. So we see that with the chemical state that I showed before, chemical, chemical state that I showed before, we have almost the same kind of formula between the state of the n-qubit register and the quantum state of a physical problem. The only difference here is the number of states, but it's actually the difference between a state that conserves the number of electrons, and here it doesn't, because we can be we can have any number of zero and ones associated to the bit strip. So we can have any number of electrons. So we have the same number of orbitals. So one qubit is one orbital okay, <laughs> in terms of the number. If you have a problem with 100 orbitals, we need 100 qubits. But all the space generated by the qubits is actually larger than the state that is necessary to describe the problem with a fixed number of electrons. So we can actually sometimes break the symmetry if we consider this, and Sad will uh, talk uh, about it more than uh, I do uh, tomorrow. All right. So we have this mapping here, one to one mapping between the uh, computational basis of the quantum computer and the many body basis of slapper determinants of your chemical problem. So each of the occupation of the orbitals are actually encoded in a bit strong, zero or one of the quantum computer. Is it clear? So that's the most simple encoding that we have. I will not present the other one. Uh, most of the people are using uh, this uh, this uh, encoding simply because it's not so easy to analyze the result. When you get a bit string, you know that you can directly associate it to a given configuration of your system, of your problem, uh, even slightly determinant. So uh, it's quite uh, quite intuitive to work with that. So if we do that, if we do this encoding. Then we can transform the annihilation and, cre and creation operators into Pauli strings this way. So this big uh, tensor product here means that you apply the tensor product uh, so from i uh, equal to p equals 1 to n. So you have a, a big number of tensor product of identity uh, operator. <laughs> Time for the z. And so you apply this um, this formula, this mapping, to transform each creation and annihilation operator into a chain of Pauli operator, which we call the Pauli strip. Hmm. As you see, you have only Pauli uh, matrices here. And the string of the z operator that you have at the end, it's actually to fulfill uh, the uh, anti chemical commutation rules. So the commutation <laughs> trace factor for fermions. If ever you have bosons, uh, you would not need any of those uh, z uh, operators. <laughs> okay. Um, so now I would like to. Um, to talk about the quantum algorithm. So we want to measure the energy of our system. So that's my uh, goal. I want to measure the energy 
and solve the Schrodinger equation. I know I can encode my system, so, uh, all my uh, my Hamiltonian, onto uh, Pauli strings and a linear combination of Pauli strings, thanks to the jordan wigner encoding. <laughs> and I also know that for a system of n orbitals, I can encode it in a qubit register with n qubits. Okay, that's what I will do. And so for this, I will do it on the right board as well. So the quantum phase estimation, as its name uh, tells us, it's we want to measure the phase of a unitary operator of the, one of the eigenvectors of a unitary operator. So here, as an example, I showed the unitary, the is the propagation, the propagator, so exponential of uh, IHT. And the algorithm is quite complex, but uh, we need a little value. First, let's maybe just have a word on the uh, Jordan beginner encoding. Imagine I have a system with four orbitals like this. Uh, so it's always spin orbitals. One uh, qubit corresponds to one spin orbital. <laughs> and I want to uh, implement the R3 Fox state. So this is uh, the molecular diagram of the molecule. I, for the uh, for the artifact state, I put the electrons on the lowest uh, energy uh, orbitals. Okay, so this is my uh, configuration for the artifact state. And so, if I want to write it in a occupation number representation, this will be empty, empty, occupied, occupied. So for a system with four spin orbitals and two electrons, this is my state of state. And as a circuit, we have four qubits initialized in state zero. And I want to apply this state. So again, it depends on the convention you are using, but you can write it this way. And this gives you the of state. So it's very easy to uh, to build actually on this kind of uh, configuration. It will be useful in the in the following just to know that. Okay. But let's now derive the quantum phase uh, estimation. So it's made of two kind of register. You see, there is one big register here and another big register at the bottom that will be controlled by the state of the first register. And you will see why. Okay. So if we want to model the state of the total system, let's start first with the state of the first register that is called the Elsila register. So First, it starts with only zeros. Okay, so it could be written uh, this way, for instance, with uh, n qubits. <clears throat> then, what we do is to apply the Adamar gate on all of those qubits. So it's a superposition of zero and one. So if we do that for all the qubits, we have something like that. Now what we see is that I prepared the, uh, the initial state of the second register, so that is called the system register, because that's when we were, uh, the register that goes the wave function of our physical problem. I encoded it in the Artifog state. So that's the first uh, register, that the second one. For the moment, they are not correlated. They are completely separated here. Okay, so I can really uh, run those. I implemented the artifact state. 
which actually can be uh, written in the eigenbasis of the problem I have in the So, uh, combination, linear combination of, uh, of all the, the eigenvectors of our problem. So, the psi j are really the eigenvectors of our Hamiltonian, the, the state we are really interested in. We will see that those coefficients are actually important. So what we want, if we want, for instance, at the end to measure the ground state energy and have the ground state going to function, we will need this coefficient to be high, or the high value. So normally, in most of the programs, we have perfect state at a large order map with the ground state of the program. So it's fine. Otherwise, it's called the, uh, I forgot the name. But if you have another lab that is zero, you cannot get the pronostic. So that we will see uh, later on. <clears throat> okay. So this is at the beginning, and then we want to apply the uh, the gates. So let's write the full system, and then we will apply the control data. So it's a bit cumbersome to uh, write all the tensor product of the ancillary register. So we can write it in a different way. So I will first start with the system register, tensor product. And uh, just to so uh, I can write it this way. The big tensor product that I had uh, before on the top, if I use the binary representation uh, with the integer uh, notation, so the k is an integer, and each integer corresponds to a different big string. So here I in did have 2 to the power of n different big string. Okay, so I really have the superposition of all the bit string that are possible with n cubes. That's what does the full set of Adamar gates on the n cubes. Okay. Now we will apply controlled unitary gates with a sum power uh, in front. And so those unitary gates are exponential of i h. Okay, so let's see. If we apply it with a control of the unitaries, so we just write the factor remains the same. Uh, then uh, this summation. Coefficient remain the same and we for the moment. And what do we do? So you remember this control operation means that we apply the gate only if the qubit state is in a in state one. And the qubit in the state of qubit uh, this qubit is in state one. Actually, this notation I will, I will use it later. For the moment, I will keep uh, it will be simple to just keep the uh, So now uh, that, so let's consider the first qubit. So the qubit on the top, it has a control gate that will be applied here if the qubit is in state one. So we have the zeros, and if qubit is in state one, we apply exponential of i h t. Okay, uh, to the power <coughs> two to the n minus one. So it's minus one. 
So we have exponential of e h two to the n minus one t of one. Okay, and it's actually applied to psi uh, j. So the uh, exponential of h, which is applied on the system register with the psi j, it's the energy of psi j. So it's e j. And I do the same, the same for the other ones. So the second uh, NC attribute is also written this way. Zero plus, okay. It will have, uh, imagine this one is the second qubit of the NCLA. If it's in stage one, I apply U to the power of two, two to the power of N minus two. Exponential A, J, two to the N minus two, D. One. And I continue until the last one. AJ due to the power of zero. Uh, is there a psi j missing? Uh, yes, there is a psi j missing. Yeah. And so this kind of thing here. It's called the phase kickback. So usually in the community, you have the same stuff. So why kickback? Well, I actually don't really know, but uh, this is because it's controlled. So um, if the QBT is in state one, we have a, a phase kickback on the, uh, on the system register. Okay. Excuse me, I can take the number of 5G, there are people who be done. No, no, no. Um, so um, the artifact slatter determinant, so which correspond to one configuration, one many body, one of the uh, configuration of the many body basis, is can actually be written as a linear combination of the eigenvector of your arbitrary. Normally, it's the opposite way around. We are we are used to write uh, the ground state of our system as a linear combination, uh, as a linear combination of uh, of all our slatter determinants, right? Usually, right? Like this. Yes, but we can do the other way around. The of the yeah. yeah, it's really uh, this is really called an excited state of the many body problem. We will see that it will be important later, but we, we could go directly with a psi zero at the beginning, but we don't know how to prepare it because we don't have psi zero. So we usually work with uh, something below, like our first. And we hope we hope that it has a more zero overlap with the, the state we are interested in. With many body uh, true eigen state of the problem. Okay, so that is nice. So we ended up here. Uh, I can write it differently. As I wanted to do before, but I think it was better to show the face back uh, for each qubit. Now, if I want to summarize a bit more, uh, so I have this uh, factor here. Summation over j of ij. Uh, expo the exponential of ij uh, k. I use the 
When you apply uh, one, one means that psi is, is true as function. It's, it's truly a transfer product. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's in the space of the transfer products. When it's not a normal psi. Uh, uh, you mean those one here? What? Sorry, I missed the question. The way it's written yeah, means what I, I'm not sure to understand the, what means one. Is is it one particular orbital? Yeah, maybe I, uh, okay, I was not clear on this point. Okay. Okay. There are two qubit registers. One is called the ancilla register, and we don't care about the meaning of the zero and the ones. It does not correspond to any physical thing. Okay. So it's really something that we done at the end. It's useful for the calculation, but it does not correspond to the system we are looking at. However, the second register does encode a physical system. So for this one, indeed, the zero and the ones, because of the Jordan Wigner encoding, I could do something else, but I did not talk about it. Jordan Wigner encoding. Each bit string of this system, so like the artifact state I showed before, 0, 0, 1, 1, here the 0 and the 1 indeed correspond to the occupation of a given orbital of the system. Okay, but not for the ancilla. So the ancilla here, it's uh, the ones and the system register here. <laughs> Other questions? So this can actually be shown quite uh, easily. Each uh, bit string corresponding to the integer k, we can see with a simple uh, math or logic uh, that it indeed corresponds to uh, uh, having a coefficient k in front of this phase. So for instance, for the state 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so which corresponds to the integer 0, we see that we don't have any phase kickback nowhere. So indeed, if k equals zero here, we don't have it. Like this is equal to one. Okay. If you have only this state that has a phase feedback, not the other one, we indeed have only the value integral one in the bit string, which corresponds to the simple phase feedback. If k equals one, it's a uh, you can see. It. Okay, so that's the state we obtain here. Before the QFT minus one, we can actually go quantum Fourier transform, the inverse of the quantum Fourier transform. That I will not describe, and I think uh, Zachary will describe it uh, tomorrow. So I will let him the, the chance to do that. I will just write what it does. So the QFT, quantum Fourier transform. It actually maps the given states it really looks like a standard for the things So the oh, and it happens that because it's uh, it can be made of all reversible quantum gates, quantum fully transform the black box I have here is reversible. I can increase it, so I can apply the inverse transformation. Okay. So let's assume that we indeed can do this kind of transformation that Zachary will show to one. And if I do so, you see that I have basically the same expression on the top. 
Yeah. Right? So I can actually, on my ancilla register, so all this, all this thing here. Uh, is exactly similar to the quantum phase uh, transform. So if I invert it, I can go back to the, to the state J. Yeah, so there is a AJ uh, coefficient. Yeah, in the, she's outside. In the, uh, okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Right. And so if I do so, here. Yeah. I apply the quantum Fourier transform inverse, inverse of the quantum Fourier transform. <coughs> what I obtain is summation of J of uh, AJ. Uh, so here, the J is actually E the J T, where we put some different factors, typically, in J T, uh, I think there are some division between two by uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> after <coughs> the coefficients in form, but it's not so important. the form of the uh, you obtain something like that. I don't want to be wrong about the coefficients, but uh, it should be uh, something like uh, at least related to the phase we are interested in, right? We remember that we are interested in the getting the phase of the unitary transformation, uh, the unitary operator, meaning the energy of our system. So now, what do you think will happen when we measure the ancilla register? So all the qubits, so the last step of this algorithm. You, can you explain the notation for the first kit? The last for this one? Yes. Um, so, uh, it's kind of a... It's, um, it's a state that corresponds to a given phase. And when, when we will measure it, we we'll get a binary string. That's a... Uh, so So this is a phase, the, what, what you write in the case is a, is a phase or form. Yeah, that is the state corresponding to the phase that you will measure. When you measure it. So it's, a, it's still a state. And it's only when we will measure it that we can extract the phase. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a notation saying that uh, it corresponds to this phase. So we are so state the state the job in the we assume that it is an integer in between them. Yeah, exactly. So, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's a binary representation uh, of a state. When I will measure it, I will get some binary number quite close to the value of the phase. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can just imagine it's a state that when measure we give them there. And indeed, when we measure all the ancilla objective measurements, you will collapse to a different state. So you will collapse to a state that corresponds to this phase. So uh, uh, if you collapse to, uh, to this one, let's just call it. It this way to the value of all the, 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 the coefficients we don't have. If we measure, we can end up with this state with which kind of probability? Well, with the probability given by the square of the amplitude in front, with probability <coughs> j square. And what happens also to uh, the system register? Because they are correlated. They are correlated. So if we measure this phase, this phase, we will have the system register that ends up also in a uh, in psi j. So the system register collapses 
looks like J, and this one collapses into the state corresponding to the face EJT with a given probability that is AJ squared. It's relatively clear, but you So if I have to summarize a bit, just with the pictures. So if you look at the full quantum estimation algorithm, first you have this superposition of all the ancilla, thanks to the Adamar gate. Then you apply all the unitary transformation, which gives you this space kickback thing. And you can recognize the inverse quantum Fourier transform to go back this kind of state. So this is the ancillary register state. And this is the register, other system register states. It's a linear combination of both. They are untangled, right? So we don't know yet what we will measure. We can measure any of those uh, J uh, uh, binaries. And once we measure, we get one estimation of this phase, which is given with n bits of accuracy. So actually, the binary uh, representation of the state can also be integral, but also not integral. It can also be a function. So stuff like that. We can uh, we can compute a new number thanks to a binary representation. So that's what is done actually uh, when we measure that. You measure a given binary string that is related to a given real number. It's a digit of accuracy that is given by the number of ancilla that you consider, so the number of, uh, of qubits. And the probability is given by the overlap between your starting state and the state you collapse on. But so if you want the, let's say, the ground state, if you are interested in the ground state, so how do you know that you have obtained the, the ground state? So you cannot know, except if you do the measurements several times. And if you, if, uh, of course, you have some technically uh, intuitive intuition about a good prepared initial state, then you know that the overlap is supposed to be high. So if you do the experiment, I don't know, 20 times, you see that you obtain 15 times the same results. It means that it's uh, the value of the constant. But indeed, you cannot do it uh, only one time. The only way you can do this only one time is, is if you prepare the correct state at the beginning, which of course is not possible for us. Yes, so, so when you will do the measurement at the end, so each qubit will give any a probability or all the qubits together will give a one probability? So you measure all the qubits together. Uh, I mean, if you do it at the same time or not, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But the results that you get from measuring all the ancillary qubits has this probability. Of course, you can also compute the probability of getting only one zero or one uh, zero or one on one qubit, but it uh, it doesn't help to recover any in useful information for this algorithm. I'm a bit confused. Uh, so I have an impression you said that EJT must be an integral, or it should be. Which well, means that the time must be very specific to the state you're trying to calculate. So the time is actually a factor that is defined properly to be sure that the phase that you measure is in a circle of two parts. Okay. Because otherwise you could have a ground state or excited state that come back to uh, the value uh, around the ground state and stuff. So you want all the spectrum to be represented uh, in between a given uh, so zero between zero and five, such that you are sure that uh, that uh, yeah you get the phase uh, correspond to a given energy and you are because it's modulo to pi so. How do you map the unitary evolution of wavelength in the quantum circuit? 
So uh, sad will show that later uh, in more detail than I do. I will show one example, but uh, yeah, we will show, show that too. we cannot do it directly. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated. We don't know how to do that. For the moment, it's black box. All right. So that was quantum phase estimation. So let's see what time I have. <laughs> Does it mean I No, I think you can go until one. Is it doable? You have 10 slides left. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 10 slides left, but uh, I will skip this one. I will go fast. So this is the single quantum phase estimation. I wanted to show also the proof that uh, it's not possible. So the big difference is that you have a single ancillary qubit. You won't have a lot of ancillary qubits. And the difference also here, you measure directly the energy on the quantum computer, okay? With a given accuracy, uh, depending on the number of density that you have, but you could measure an energy. Here, it will not be the case anymore. We have a single ancilla, so it can be on the zero or one. Obviously, it cannot correspond to a given representation of your energy. And still, we prepare the state in the same manner. We apply also the same kind of unitary operation. And then we have this, what is called tomography gate for measurements. And these gates depend on several things that I will not show, unfortunately. But, uh, so this is the state that you have before the gate. So you see that I applied a, a phase kickback again on the system register if the qubit is in state one. Yeah. So it's exactly the same. When you apply the tomography gate and you apply several different measurements that are already, you can control those kind of measurements. Okay. I'm not entering into details, but at the end, it allows you to reconstruct a given function of K that is this one. So this algorithm is very different than the other one because it, you have to do post-processing. You have to do a lot of measurements, combine all the information about those measurements on a classical computer to build a function on a classical computer. This is the function you build. And this with uh, some methods like uh, kind of Fourier transform, Cronies uh, methods, or Bayesian techniques. You can actually, it's like identifying a key, a node uh, in a code, okay? So you have a C now that would look like this. And you can treat this signal to get actually the face of your system on a classical computer, but from measurements done on a quantum computer. Okay. Not the single and similar version of the quantum phase estimation. Another algorithm I want to describe is the variational quantum Eigen solver. This is the most well known and used algorithm nowadays for chemistry, physics, or uh, even some other kind of optimization. The point is, all the controlled unitary operation that we have on quantum computer with the quantum phase estimation, it's too big. I mean, implementing that, all of this is impossible. <clears throat> there are too much gates. We have quantum decoherence, the noise of quantum computer. It's definitely not possible to do it right now on the quantum computer that we have now. So it's only in uh, 2014 that uh, Peruzzo and co uh, invented this variational quantum mechanism. ensemble. That is actually a mix, a hybrid algorithm between a classical device and a quantum device. The point is to make much shorter circuits that are doable on a current quantum computer, and then go back to the classical circuit back and forth in, in a way that we can get all the information that we want. Let's see how it's done. It relies on the variational principle. So that if you have any trial wave function that depends on some sets of parameters, and you compute the expectation value, we can see how to compute it later, uh, you can get a close approximation to your ground state energy. Hopefully, if your answer is uh, So on a classical device, what do you do? You do first a mean field calculation to compute your art reform. Uh, orbitals, for instance, which allows you to build your second quantized Hamiltonian. 
Then you apply the Jordan Wigner transformation on the uh, annihilation creation operators to transform it into tensor of Pauli strings. So this hat P is a Pauli string. So a uh, tensor product of many Pauli operations. Those can be then easily measured on a quantum computer. So this is now the electronic structure Hamiltonian that is transformed into the qubit uh, Hamiltonian, let's say. But it's equivalent. It's, it has the exact same spectrum. Uh, and we initialize the parameter theta of the wave function. So first, what do we do on the quantum device? It's a state preparation. So imagine you have a unitary operation that depends on some parameter. So <coughs> it is a parameter of the rotation dates, for instance. Okay. Of your single qubit operation. Uh, in chemistry, we will usually use the unitary couple cluster. Uh, on that, for instance. And the couple cluster amplitudes are the related to the parameters that we update. Okay. So we start with the artifact state, for instance. This uh, bar here means that we have m qubits. Okay. Just a simplification of the notation. So we do it one time. And we will see that we need to do it on several uh, circuits. Okay. That's why I reproduced the circuit several times. But you don't have to bother with that now. Focus just on one uh, mm -hmm. line. Then what we have to do once we prepare the state, well, we want to extract the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Otherwise, we, we cannot minimize then the parameters. Okay, We cannot do the minimization. So we have to apply some uh, measurement uh, thing to get the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. I, I will get to that just after. But imagine we can do that. So we can measure the expectation value of the Hamiltonian that is written this way if we have a state psi. This is what we do. We do it on each power string. So that's why we have several circuits. We need one circuit per power string. And we can reconstruct that is then used in the classical optimization. So in the <coughs> classical computer, you do a classical optimization like uh, Meldermind, uh, Kubila, the FGS, quantum descent, any kind of optimization you want to update the parameter of the circuits, and you do it again. <coughs> so you have this uh, kind of uh, optimization process a number with a large number of iterations to get uh, an approximation of your ground state in actual. So you see, there is really a, a hybrid way of doing it between the classical and the quantum device. So the, the idea is that you want with the quantum computer to have simply the PI operator because they are uh, smaller to represent than the PH. Is that the... Uh, uh, it's uh, because uh, you cannot measure the big H directly. It's... Uh, you, we don't know how to do it. So we know how to measure a power string, mm -hmm. but we don't know how to measure a linear combination of power string because they don't all commute. Mm -hmm. We can measure a set of commuting power string, but not a set of non-commuting power string. So there are a lot of uh, active research in the field to optimize the measurement of these kind of things, but it's uh, still active. Right? Sorry, so if we are doing the optimization on the classical device, so what exactly are we are doing on the quantum device? So on the quantum device, you are preparing your states, your many body states. Yeah, so you apply gates that are defined by some unitary operation here. Okay. Imagine this unitary operation, for instance, unitary couple cluster is intractable on classical computers. We cannot do it. It's too difficult. But on a quantum computer, because everything is unitary, it's trivial. Uh, trivial. It's still a lot of uh, operations, but it's doable. It's tractable. So we could prepare, for instance, a unitary couple cluster state on the quantum computer. And then, thanks to appropriate measurement, we get back to the energy. So the quantum computer is actually measuring the expectation value of, a given, uh, of the Hamiltonian for a given state. And the classical computer is doing the minimization. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, I don't have time to go through a lot of things. So let me select the most important things. So Sad will show that uh, tomorrow. So someone asked, uh, oh, how can I implement uh, the Hamilton node, the exponentiation of the Hamilton node? Well, if the Hamiltonian is written as a summation of power string, we don't know how to implement the exponential uh, of the information of power strings, but we know how to implement the exponential of a single power string. The circuit looks like this, for instance, with this exponential. And so we will go into more details uh, tomorrow. So we, it's doable, but we have to apply what is called the trotter physics, the approximation. So we have to uh, to approximate the exponential of a sum into a product of single exponential, or for exponential of single power strings. And that for the moment, we cannot really go away. We cannot really, don't do that. Oh, no. Okay. So that's important to know. Uh, but it was just an example of that, but it's not important, so I don't talk about it. Uh, this is uh, the yeah. I will just go through this slide because it's kind of important. I think I believe it's how can we measure actually? So we measure, we get a binary string. What, what, how to measure an observable on a quantum computer for a given state? So the measurements on a hardware is usually done on the z-axis, done in the computational basis. So uh, all the binary strings, okay? So we only can get binary strings. It's the basis on which we measure. If you want to uh, uh, measure the expectation value of a given operator, P, per mission, uh, so this is given by this uh, relation here. Uh, so if the spectral decomposition of this uh, operator is uh, given here, where well, phi j are any eigenvector, of this operator, but those eigenvectors are not, uh, they can be written in the computational basis, but they are not so the computational basis, okay? So how can you access to this, uh, to this actually? Because we don't have the, the uh, overlap square of those, uh, if we prepare the state Psi, we don't have the overlap with the Psi and the eigenvectors of it. But what we have when we measure the state Psi, when you have a state psi on a quantum computer, you measure it. What you, the probability to get a given uh, computational basis, okay, a given binary string, the probability is given by the, by the square of the overlap of the two. So by repeating measurement, what you get is this information, not this one. So what is usually done is that we have to find the unitary transformation that diagonalize the operator P, and so once you do that, you end up actually in the computational basis. So uh, let's look at this final uh, equation. Uh, if you want to measure P, for instance, uh, well, you have to apply some unitary operation. So you change the state of a psi. It's like measuring then a new observable that is diagonal, diagonal in the computational basis. Okay, and so you can translate actually uh, this. Is, yeah. You can translate this equation here with this one. So you have now the overlap between the transformed wave function in the computational basis. Okay. So that's actually what I wrote uh, here, but I couldn't explain it. Yeah. So if you want to measure some uh, Pauli string p. You have to apply specific rotations first to put this uh, operator into the computational basis representation and then measure it in the computational basis. So if you have only Z operators, for instance, it's fine because you're already diagonal, diagonal in the computational basis. But if you have X or uh, Y or anything that is not in the computational basis, you first have to rotate this x into the z axis by doing some Hadamard gate, for instance. The Hadamard gate is transforming the x into z. And then you measure the z. But first, you have to apply this rotation to change the state. 
such that the expectation value remains the same between the two of them. Okay, and I will stop here. Yeah, uh, just an advertisement. We have a, a three years PhD grant with uh, Emmanuel Stemage in Strasbourg that is starting in October. If uh, you know if we are interesting or you are interesting, I don't know. Don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, Thank you very much.